Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Shannon Sanders. I'm the proud president of Nashville Music Equality. Tonight, we will discuss the parallels of sounds and the music that intersect between Memphis and Nashville. We're joined tonight by some esteemed panelists, but first, let me introduce our moderators. First, Gina Miller, NME's VP and General Manager and Senior Vice President at Monarch Music, and Julie Height, Editorial Director of WNXP and NPR's music and NPR Music Contributor. Ladies, I'll let you take it from here. Looking forward to tonight's conversation. Thank you. All right, let's uh, let's introduce our esteemed panelists. We are so lucky to have these four. I'm going to introduce Marcus Dowling first, who is brand new to Nashville. I mean, Indeed. we've seen him around here quite a bit uh, before now, but now an official resident of Nashville. He stepped Absolutely. into the role of country reporter at the Tennessean. That is a good thing for Nashville, I am telling you. And we are fortunate, we're fortunate that that gig brought you here and you bring to this conversation really multifaceted experience covering music. The work that Marcus has done for numerous outlets focusing on country and roots music over the last two years has really made an impact but he did not just start paying attention to music or covering music in the last two years or I'll writing about it then. He's been following music makers and movements in so many different kinds of music, dance music, electronic music, R&B and hip hop and a million other things over the course of his career. So that is the kind of depth and breadth of knowledge and experience he's bringing to the table. And Charles Hughes is both music head and scholar, truly. He's a historian on the faculty of Rhodes College, where he serves as director of the Lynn and Henry Turley Memphis Center, and in fact, teaches a course called The History of Memphis. He's published timely articles, all the time you should watch for his work as well when things ha are happening in music the call for his expertise and he is also the author of the book why bushwick bill matters that came out last year and the book country soul making music and making race in the american south and in country soul which we will hear about tonight he complicates the popular utopian narrative of racial integration and harmony in the studio during the heyday of southern soul Oh. Clap, 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 claps. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start with Lorenzo Washington. The Jefferson, I mean, let me just say this, like you can't hardly even say music in Nashville without saying the name Lorenzo Washington, synonymous with all things art, history, R&B, jazz, and the legacy that's been such an important home to so many artists from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and we're just going to believe and beyond. Lorenzo Washington is the founder and curator of the Jefferson Street Sound Museum. Jefferson Street Sound Museum is a museum that is dedicated to his life, to turning his home into a haven for artists who built their careers right now as who built their careers on what is known now as the original music row. We'll get more into that. Lorenzo has made it his passion to continue to support, preserve, and honor the legacy of those artists who played on Jefferson Street between the 1940s and 1970s. The goal is to educate and empower the North Nashville community about our Black roots in music. What I also want you to know is that Lorenzo has a book we need you to go to the website right now, jeffersonstreetsound.com, and order it. We also want you to know that there's a campaign to renovate what is known as the JSS Recording Studio. They're open every Saturday from 11 to 4, and the music series happens every Sunday, 5 to 8. Tickets can be purchased, and more importantly, donations can be received 24-7. So I hope you will take some time to get to know more about Lorenzo's work at the Jefferson Sound Museum and go visit the museum by all means. They have 
a lo- it's a lovely exhibit if you haven't had a chance to walk through um, what all is going on there. Lawrence Boo Mitchell. Here we go. Now I'm gonna kind of con- try to convince this as much as I can. Uh, before we, you know, in the in the in the green room before you all joined us, uh, we were celebrating and, and really saluting Boo's work. I don't know if that is really known um, outside of the industry community, but he has been for sure a spokesperson and advocate um, in the last week. So this is re- really current on behalf of creators and artists' rights. Um, advocacy work on behalf of the Recording Academy. So I think that's worth mentioning. So people, you know, put us in this box of only producer, only, 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 and there's much that concerns you and much work that you're doing. And I'm proud that you're my my friend and are out here rolling up your sleeves on on behalf of all that you're doing. Along with that, though, there are some things to mention. Let me see here. Grammy Award winning engineer, producer, composer, movie producer, and studio owner. Boo, the son of High Records, legendary, I would say, High Records, and Al Green's producer, Remy Mitchell. Boo began his historic musical journey at home. I mean, really, right there at the house, at his father's studio, at grandpa. I don't even have to read this. Y'all, I know this story because I have the the honor of being able to say that Royal Studios is in my neighborhood. Like, I, I, I know Royal Studios, but, we, you know, I'm trying to stay professional. So I'm going to stay professional. So I will say that spanning the lifetime of Boo Mitchell's work, he has worked with artists such as Al Green, Buddy Guy, Rod Stewart, Solomon Burke, Anthony Hamilton, and continues to build on the legacy and the work started by his father. Um, Additionally, I mentioned his work with Recording Academy, and now I would say we can add even more phenomenal artists to that list. The young Al Green, there's Bruno Mars, there's Keith Richards, there's John Meyer, there's Edwin Hawkins, Kev Moe, and the list goes on and on. I'm gonna start right there and we're gonna get into it because we can read all of these bios from now to tomorrow. I'm just excited, I am proud, Um, it is, a real honor to be here with all of you tonight. So I think we should just pause right there and get into it if it's okay. I want to thank everybody too for coming out. I think that's already been said, but you can't, you can't say thank you enough. So there's another thank you again. All right, let's see here. Where do I want to start? I and mean, then here's here's the hard part, Julie. I mean, in these moments, I mean, we've had some of these conversations over years now. And when we get into these moments where we're trying to stay contained time-wise, we want to make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time. Um, but it's also such a dynamic conversation that it's hard for me to you know, stick to some of the things that we want to really make sure that we get to. But I will say, I'm going to start this first question and direct it to Charles. There's a popular version of Miss Memphis history that's a little superficial and focuses on the heyday of Bill Street, Stax Records, and Sun Records, and how Stax in particular was a haven of racial harmony. Can you paint a picture for us of how collaboration and aspiration and the exchange of influences actually worked in an integrated studio setting like Stax? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I will, I will. I will do my best. And thank you so much uh, for having me and and for putting me in this incredible company. Uh, a couple of folks who I've been able to share space with before, and a couple of folks who I have not. And it's so great to see everybody here this evening. Um, so, you know, when thinking about about Memphis and the kind of the stories we tell about Memphis, and particularly about Memphis music. Um, one of the things that I think is obviously very central, or it has become central, <clears throat> is the notion that Memphis has been a place where the races have been able to come together through music and overcome either historical or contemporary racism and uh, injustice, right? And you hear that playing out a lot, sometimes even in situations um, like Sun Records, where 
uh, this narrative somehow exists, even though, you know, after he found Elvis, Sam Phillips basically got rid of all of his black artists, etc. right? There's certainly a lot of truth to the idea that in Memphis, as in most places, right, including in Nashville, um, there was really important cross-racial music being made, and it was being made at every level, including in famous recording studios that we think of. Um, and we need to celebrate that, not because it represents, you know, sometimes you'll hear this, like people will say, oh, the musicians were able to forget about race, right? Or we're not even see race or hear race. And I understand why that's the framing and I'm, I, I get it. But I also think that part of what makes what they did so powerful and so heroic in these moments is that they absolutely understand or understood that race was part of it, right? They were able to confront it and, and get over it most of the time. Now, there were plenty of examples, some of which are more famous than others, of, of racial conflict in the studio, uh, of people maybe taking songwriting credit they didn't deserve, or other things, production credit they didn't deserve, and those people were white people, just to make it as plain as I can, right? But to me, what's really critical, especially thinking now in 2022, about the way that that story is told and how many stories exist that are, I think, different and richer and more important is quite frankly, and I'm generalizing a bit here, but I'm, 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 I'm saying this pretty, pretty intentionally. So often the central narrative of, of Memphis music as being this kind of uh, racially utopian space or whatever, ends up weirdly erasing the centrality of black musicians within it because we all of a sudden start crediting the fact that white people were in the studios at certain points with that somehow the key part of the story or Elvis as, as this you know artist who obviously, I mean, I love Elvis and we could talk a lot about Elvis, right? But even the notion that Elvis Presley becomes the kind of symbol of this cross-racial interplay along with other white artists, et cetera, it has this weird effect, I think, of um, downplaying, number one, just how brilliant and how hardworking uh, Black musicians were and the fact that these were all Black-rooted and Black-created musical infrastructures, right? Um, despite the fact that white musicians in particular unquestionably played an important role and white leadership at Stax Records played an important role. Uh, although, you know, Jim Stewart was going to record country music until his sister Estelle, who also loaned him the money to open the thing to begin with, uh, she was like, I've got a bunch of local kids coming in to the record store here in South Memphis, and I think we ought to make some R&B records, including with some of them, right? So even that story gets a little simplified. But I think that beyond the fact that we need to recenter this historically so that it doesn't appear as though it's only important when the white people show up and the, then it stops being important when the white people leave. But also because when we're thinking about who has made the money or who has the kind of cultural ownership of these ideas, a lot of times white folks end up with with the capital, both in terms of the capital as in terms of money, which of course, I don't imagine in this group, I have to you know talk about how important the money is in the music industry, right? Um, but also in terms of cultural capital, which is kind of an academic -y term, but basically means who is in control of the story, who gets to tell the story and who did they put forward? Um, and I think that one of the lessons of Memphis music and one of the things that I try to talk about all the time, including with my students here at Rhodes College, is that when we're talking about interracial collaboration, which is such a powerful story in the Memphis music story, without a doubt, right? And I'm not shaming or shading any of those incredible white contributors, right? But when we, when we talk about these things in terms of interracial collaboration, we cannot simply stop at who's making the music together, right? We have to think about who's profiting from that music, who's controlling the narrative about that music, and whose music gets to be considered important enough to preserve, right? Both in terms of the music itself and the spaces where it took place. Um, that I think is in, in some ways, uh, and again, we don't lose anything from, in, from the richness or the importance you know, of the story. As I tell students all the time, you know, Memphis, Tennessee transformed world popular culture three times in 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. Like very few places have done that. 
And I think that it's, it doesn't make it a less important or interesting story. Um, I would argue actually, uh, it makes it quite the opposite to do that. Okay. Well, that leads me perfectly into my next question. Anyone can feel free to tag on. I'm really just gonna take a little bit of what Charles has already teed up and it falls right nicely into what I was gonna say. How did race of musicians, producers, songwriters, artists actually factor into opportunity, mobility, agency, ownership, and compensation in your opinion? You want to elaborate a little more on that? Well, I'll hop in. Um, I'll say that it's a case of systemic racism in the music industry and that, you know, from like the 1920s, if you look at the history of country music until the present day, and that impacts economics in the sense that these are white controlled structures and country is unique in the sense that it's a top down industry. So country starts at the very top and trickles down. And the economics when it's baked in with old white men who have had these jobs for multiple decades, their level of economic control almost becomes onerous. and to the point where artists and songwriters who are not white men don't benefit from that system unless they are extraordinar extraordinarily talented and able to deal with astounding levels of racism for a long and extended period of time. Uh, I was having a conversation with someone recently and I, was, I said there's a long history from Charlie Pride to Jamie Moore of people in Nashville who have dealt with ridiculous levels of angst, but also being able to like create incredible bodies of work that always hit the top of the charts. And that's that speaks number one to the incredible level of talent that black people have in any industry. But it also speaks to this, the point of just what it takes to be economically sustainable as a person of color, you know, in Nashville's industry or in Memphis's industry or any industry for that matter, like in the last hundred years, especially in the country and sold to country defined space. Okay, so let me throw this to Boo and then I'm gonna let him answer and we'll toss it to Julie. Marcus, perfectly said, let's move into this, the economic stability here because I do find it fascinating. I don't know if many people who are watching and who will see this have been to Memphis first and foremost, um, to really understand the contrast of community, of neighborhoods, right? Of, to understand when we're talking about, you know, even within Memphis, when we're talking about location, um, Sun Studios, when we're talking about Stacks, when we're talking about Royal, um, there's definitely some distinction to just neighborhood, right? Just the differences. In the comparison to what was happening here in Nashville, on, Music Row versus the original Music Row. Like there's some, so there's certainly some um, disparity that's just obvious in just infrastructure of neighborhood and what community would do. Your father, being the great songwriter, arranger, producer, um, Willie Mitchell for y'all who missed that earlier, was coming up and establishing himself in a lane separate from Stacks. High Records and Royal Studios, at the same time, though, you said in other interviews that he dealt early on with white business partners or producers who wouldn't let him touch the board or who didn't give him enough of a say in the way things were recorded, engineered, or mixed, or didn't give him the proper credit by not putting his photo on the cover of the records. How do you, I mean, this plays right into the advocacy work you're doing now, because this is a lived experience um, for you and your family. But how do you see his trajectory from those early imbalances of power to asserting his musical agency more fully, being truly in charge of the studio and cultivating the sophisticated sound that he wanted on those algorithm records? Well, uh, he basically had, you know, he had to fight and um, I mean, every step of the way, the the first three Willie Mitchell records didn't have his picture on it. The, the first record had just uh, text. Um, Pop was an instrumental artist. Um, 
So it just had words, and then his second record had a picture of a white lady on it. His third record had a picture of a white lady, um, and he really overcome. He overcame uh, the racism, you know, by people helping him and you know seeing his plight. Uh, it was there was a Jewish promotion man named Dicky Klein that was. Uh, instrumental in breaking uh, uh, the records uh, that were recorded at Royal un under the high label. Um, and he basically told the owners, he was like, if y'all don't put Willie's picture on the next record, I'm not working another record for you guys. And Pop's picture was on the next record. Um, you know, it was the engineer Ray Harris that was the original engineer here. Um, who came from Sun and basically told Pop, you know, black people can't touch the board, you can't engineer. So, compounded with all the other stuff, uh, about three or four albums in, Pop's down with the owner of High Records, a man by the name of Joe Kugi, and says, you know, Joe, if I don't engineer my own stuff, I'm not you know, re-signing with High because Pop was a, he was a, a creator from day one and he always wanted a distinct sound in his records and he used to complain that you can't tell the difference between a Willie Mitchell record and a Stax record or a Motown record, you know, and that was his, um, so once he started engineering, uh, you know, everything changed. He started, you know, selling more records than other people on the label. Um, and it, it was really Joe Coogie uh, that believed in my dad. And when Pop discovered Al Green in 68, and he was still dealing with racism here, trying to get Al recorded, um, Finally, uh, in 70, when Joe Coogie passed, he willed his shares in high records to my dad. Um, so, you know, the struggle, the struggle was always there, but just like anything else, it took people from both sides of the fence to overcome. It, it couldn't just be the, the, the black folks asking for justice. It had to be some you know, white folks that wanted justice too, or, or things wouldn't have changed. Um, and, you know, once he uh, fully just took over the day-to-day -day operations of Royal and, and High, he started, you know, pumping out Al Green hits and was able to really uh, shape the sound the way he wanted and to make his records have a distinct sound that you you can, you know, you can still hear it to this day, you know, immediately when an Al Green record comes on or when a, a, any Willie Mitchell produced record, O.B. Wright and Peoples, I mean, his body of work is staggering. And, you know, I, I remember being at a movie with my wife, um, we were watching this movie, The 51st State with Samuel Jackson, and this song comes on and I was like, whoa that's not pop, somebody is really stealing. And it ended up being a O.B. Wright song that I hadn't heard. Um, so, you know, he, uh, it was, he overcame these things with, you know, perseverance and other people helping him. And Boo, you, you mentioned when we were in the green room, you know, and we were talking a little bit about the distinctness of of that production sound um on those al green records i mean the way they were recorded the way everything was mic'd just the the art and the science that that willie mitchell worked out to get that just supple sumptuous sophisticated soul sound that even even now even to this day people still try and take some of the, the credit for that away. I mean, you you said that there was just a piece 
published maybe this week in in Mojo that was taking some of the credit for the 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 shaping of that one of a kind sound. Could you could you tell us about that? Yeah, it's really unfortunate. Um, there was an article. It's the fiftieth anniversary of the Let's Stay Together album, and there was a. A, a really nice long article written by a Memphis journalist, uh, Bob Mayer, and he interviewed um, one of the engineers from Arden Studios, a, a guy that was around back in the day, and Terry Manning. And in the article, basically, Terry, Mr. Manning says that he and Willie Mitchell mixed Let's Stay Together and loads of other Al Green singles at Ardent Studios. So in effect, you know, that's just a, 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 a severe, a severely egregious statement for anybody that knows, anybody and everybody that knows my dad and how he operated. It's just, you know, it's a shocking untruth. Um, and 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 if you know it's like rewriting history um you're taking this man's legacy my studio's legacy and crediting it with another studio it just it makes no sense like all the uh, and this this man is credited nowhere on any of al green's records and uh it's like marcus was saying earlier it's more likely that a black artist wouldn't receive credit for what they did uh, than a white person back in the day. And, you know, uh, my family is severely upset. Uh, the writer is, you know, writing a, a, a retraction, a, a letter to the editor of Mojo that will uh, be in the beginning of the magazine to try to write this injustice and apparently this man has been saying this in other interviews and you know the problem is that if you tell a lie in an interview and somebody prints it that lie becomes fact um and you know it's just really sickening that somebody would uh say that or or, or do that I mean, that that goes back to what um, Charles was saying as well about who has the power to tell the story, who is in a position to to shape the history. And, you know, we've been talking about Nashville. So let's let's talk a little bit about I mean, we've been talking about Memphis. Let's talk about Nashville alongside Memphis, um, because Nashville has its own sanctioned telling of, of music history. And at the center of that, you know, are well-known institutions like Music Row and the Grand Ole Opry and the predominantly white, you know, country music industry that has grown up around that. So when you think of, of that, th that history that people know, the history that's been marketed and, and sold and promoted, Marcus, what what do you see left out of that telling of history? History is told by the victors. I'll start any conversation with Nashville about that being the case. And ironically, one of the greatest selling number one hit single artists in Nashville history is Charlie Pride. He had 29 number one singles on billboards, you know, uh, radio charts, which is puts him in a top uh, but the thing is, is that because history is told by the victors, people like Obi McClinton and artists like Big Al Downing and people like Linda Martell are not included in that telling of the history. I mean, I can name off the top of my head 25 white guys in Nashville right now who haven't achieved number one, but who have 12 number five singles, and they are talked about every single day. Uh, that goes to the notion that Nashville, because it's in the heart of the South, uh, had the comfort of, of racial segregation to fall back on for so many years. And it has a way of white walling a lot of the genre in the sense that 
you know, people like Obi McClinton, especially, because Obi's fascinating because uh, he was on Enterprise Records, which was distributed by, which was created by Stax. And when Stax, you know, got an influx of money after, you know, like shutting down for a couple of years, like the first thing that they did was try to break into Nashville. And Obi McClinton from Sinatobia, Mississippi, is their guy. And he necessarily didn't record all the time in Nashville proper, but those records were definitely pushed into Nashville. And, you know, like uh, Big Al Downing in the late 70s and early 80s was signed to Capitol Records. And he was in physically in Nashville. And his dream was to play on the Grand Ole Opry, and he did. And he also started with Hee Haw and did all of those things. But you don't hear about that because, again, history's told by the victors. And when Charlie Pride has 29 number one singles, that certainly changes the way that you look at things. And, uh, and that's the thing that even lasts until this day. Like, I can name... 25 black men and women in Nashville right now, but the only people you hear about in the press are Mickey Guyton and Jimmy Allen and Kane Brown and Darius Rucker every single day. I mean, that's different. You know, four artists are better than one artist, but still when you can name again, 30 people who are not black who haven't achieved a number one single in Nashville right now, that says a lot. Uh, and I think that the fascination about that is that, and we'll get to this probably deeper, a lot, a lot deeper later, is that Nashville on a national level, as this kind of like catch all for country music, is fascinating in the sense that so much of it is inspired by Memphis. Uh, speaking of Charlie Pride, the person who is responsible for producing and engineering Charlie Pride's biggest hits is Cowboy Jack Clement. Cowboy Jack Clement was born in Memphis, Tennessee. And that, that says everything. And the reason why Cowboy Jack Clement was likely able to produce Charlie Pride is because he grew up listening to records by Rufus Thomas and uh, Ike Turner and B.B. King. So he understands the uniqueness of the black voice being on country records because that's just part of his, his youth. And that's fascinating in the sense that if you look at like the Nashville sound, even deeper, and this goes to a conversation I had with Boo when I went to Royal Studios this summer. I was down there for Memphis Fest, and I toured all the stuff in Memphis. I went to Stacks, I went to Royal, I went to Graceland, some studios, the whole deal. And I asked him, I said, like, how responsible is Memphis for the Nashville sound? Without missing a beat, boy, Boo, I'll, I'll, I'll say it, without missing a beat, he says, well, Reggie Young took the, the Memphis sound and took it to Nashville when he left after so a fascinating thing about this, and I don't mean to eat up too much time, but a fascinating thing about this is in and around 1973-1974, a fascinating thing happens in the music industry. Uh, Stax Records goes out of business, which effectively kills a large chunk of soul music's history and also jobs for working musicians in the city of Memphis. So Nashville always wanted to follow a trend. Again, Nashville always one to follow a trend that goes until the modern day starts taking musicians like Reggie Young from Memphis and just taking them out of I-40 into Nashville. Uh, it also helps that Elvis Presley is a Memphis resident, but is recording in Studio B at RCA, which is on Music Row in Nashville, Tennessee. So there's like a migration and the black artists because Charlie Pride, again, history is told by the victors, Charlie Pride has 29 number one singles. You're not going to see Al Green, although he was talented at singing country songs, ending up on Music Row. That's not going to happen. You're not going to see Isaac Hayes, who sang Glenn Campbell songs, ending up on Music Row. That's not going to happen. So that's a fascinating thing to think about when you think about that. But um, I definitely want to stop there because I definitely want Lorenzo to talk about local Nashville because that's a far more fascinating story. Well, you teed it up perfectly. Thank you for that. So I'm going to ask the question to Lorenzo to, to set the stage for us so we can, we can get the idea here. Can you paint the picture for us of the activity, the opportunity, the, the energy, the music, and everything that was going around, uh, going around, um, going on around that time of, I mean, wherever you want to start. Black musicians, 
were found on Jefferson Street playing blues, R&B, soul music, in clubs that were vibrant, that were brilliant, that were dynamic. I, I mean, I asked you to paint the picture. I'm just trying to get this. I, I'm just trying to tell you, and I, I wish I could have been able to experience what was going on at some point, but you were there. So you tell us in your yeah. own words, um, and especially since you have devoted a lifetime of spotlighting these artists and musicians and preserving the history that we now know um, and have dubbed the original music realm. Well, I hear us uh, calling or name calling of some of the artists and musicians uh, that uh, paved the way uh, in Memphis uh, and, and in Nashville. But I haven't heard the word Bobby Hale, who actually recorded and wrote the song Sonny. And that song was covered by 20 something different artists from Nat King Cole to Frank Sinatra, Cher, just a number of artists uh, uh, covered that song. And Bobby Hebb's family is still in Nashville. Matter of fact, I saw uh, one of his sisters uh, uh, just a few months ago. And so we've got artists like that, that paved the way here in Nashville, Deep Fort Bailey, D. Ford Bailey Sr. Uh, was the first Black to play the Grand Ole Opera uh, downtown at the age of maybe three years old. But he could blow a harmonica and tap dance at the age of three years old. But he was one to pave the way, even in the country uh, segment of music. Uh, and we had many, you know, uh, Ted Jarrett, uh, comes to mind. Ted Jarrett was a writer, uh, a songwriter, producer, uh, one of the greatest. Now he was uh, the uh, Barry Gordy of Nashville who recorded all of these great artists and musicians that, uh, that was here uh, on, on uh, uh, Jefferson Street. Uh, Marion James, Earl Gaines, uh, Benny Lattimore, Hank Crawford, uh, he worked with Hank Crawford. Now Hank Crawford actually worked with uh, Ray Charles. He was Ray Charles's uh, saxophone player and vocalist. And, and Hank also lived in this house that I'm in right now, that, that I'm sitting in. He lived upstairs where we, uh, where we put our little studio. We've got a little recording studio upstairs. And Hank Crawford lived up there uh, during the same time that Jimi Hendrix lived down the street about a block and a half uh, at uh, um, at this, uh, it was a hair salon and a school uh, downstairs in the boarding house upstairs, uh, two doors down from the Del Morocco Club. And the Del Morocco Club is where Jimi Hendrix actually uh, played during that year he was living here in Nashville. And I tell folk when they visit the museum, I just point out the door and say, well, I saw Jimi Hendrix walk up and down Jefferson Street with his guitar on his shoulder because he never had a, a guitar case for his guitar. And he walked up and down Jefferson Street. But Jefferson Street uh, was a stepping stone for many, many artists that came through Nashville, even the Memphis uh, artists uh, that uh, came through Nashville, uh, was, uh, it was a blessing to our community to have all of these great uh, artists and musicians to, to set their footprints here on Jefferson Street. And I tell the young kids now, uh, we're trying to put the studio together upstairs. Uh, we uh, had some problems during the pandemic up there, but we shut the studio down. And I tell the kids now that I would like to uh, get the kids in and to have them to come upstairs here, to come in this building and put their footprints, just like James Brown put his footprints uh, 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 Ike and Tina Turner, uh, 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 Edda James, 
uh, all of these great artists put their footprints on Jefferson Street. And uh, uh, this was a, a great place to be back during those uh, 40s through 70s, just like Memphis was. And I hear some stories from some of my friends that, because I'm 79 years old, so I was here during that time. And I'm hearing some of the stories from some of my friends that's my age that lived in Memphis. And uh, they tell me how good of a time that they had in Memphis uh, down on Beale Street. And I say, well, we had a great time here on Jefferson Street, but what we had on Jefferson Street was 30 something blocks of fun, good times uh, uh, here in, in Nashville. So, uh, and, and, and what we wanna do is to enlighten the young folk uh, about uh, the craft that they have and what we can do to help them with their craft. And that's why we're trying to raise money now to, re, to remodel the studio so that we can keep this musical legacy going here on Jefferson Street that started back in the 30s uh, doing the uh, big band music. So, uh, and I want everybody to come to the museum, the Jefferson Street Sound Museum. It's, it's not a big, big museum, but I've got a lot of content. It's a lot of stories. Each little picture uh, has a story behind it. So, um, and I'm not a, I'm not big on speaking. <laughs> well, let me but, jump in because you 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 said plenty. It was great. But one of the things that I do love that you must have been, you know, thinking ahead as to where we could possibly go with this conversation is the future. It's talking about young people. I mean, we've spent some time talking about what's been established, the past, and I loved hearing you say that you are creating and really preserving the studio and creating a place for young musicians to have a place to come and to yeah. record and to do their thing and to learn and to have a place to practice and perfect their gifts and establish themselves for the future. And so that just makes me think, I mean, when we're talking about the past, we, we certainly should be bringing up younger musicians and the differences between either city as it relates to what opportunities do they have or don't have. And I think Lorenzo, to, to your point, having a place is a big, is a big thing. Having access is a big thing. Having somewhere to go that you are welcome and that you have, you know, people around you who are pushing for you. I mean, we've heard Boo speak, speak to that too, who are, you know, pushing for you and giving you an opportunity. So I would love to hear, you know, if anyone has any more to say about what else can be done um, for the young musicians who are coming up in either city or, you know, what are they getting that necessary or what's missing that we can hopefully give some some moment here for someone who may be able to create something that's necessary um for the future too I've, right I, I, oh sorry go ahead sir go ahead no okay uh I, very very quickly and actually one of the things i've, I've i guess because i'm a historian i'm always stuck in the past but just but it is about young people and i think it's very relevant to this conversation um one thing though just to to, to jump off of actually in some way what everybody's saying is that, you know, I do think it really is just to reiterate how essential that it is to understand how many, how much of country music in Nashville's history is hiring white soul musicians from Memphis and Muscle Shoals to come transform country music. And when we think about what Nashville country is about, it's also thinking about who are in the studios creating this music that gets associated with the future because the Nashville sound is all about what's new and hot and can we put on the charts, right? And what it does is it limits the revolutionary music being made in Black Nashville or in Black Memphis, right? In the past, mm -hmm. right? It places it in the past and it says, oh, the Black music's the roots and then we're taking it as white folks love to do. We love to claim that we're the ones putting the innovative spin on something that black folks have already innovated far more than we ever could. But 
The other thing I would just briefly say, because I'm so interested to hear everybody's take on this, is that at least in Memphis, and I think I'm sure Nashville's the same way, although I'm not, I don't know enough about the history, so um, I'd love to hear more about that, but this is also a story of young people doing this, right? That like one of the things that is absolutely crucial to understand about the history of Memphis music, and this is true right up until now, is that these are often very young people doing it. And they're, you know, in the past schools and particularly black high schools and bands and that were a crucial training ground. Um, the nightclubs were a crucial training ground as soon as people were old enough to well, we still have to get away with playing in the clubs, but, um, but to this day, I think that I think that one of the lessons of Memphis music in the past, and again, I'm I'm sure it's true in Nashville as well. I'm just not certain enough to to say it for sure, is that this has always been a young person's story, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's so imperative to keep it so. But now I'm going to shut up because I I want to hear all of you brilliant people with with your good ideas of which I I I'm very good at figuring out the past. I'm not very good at the at the present or future, so I'll be quiet. Um, I'll hop in. Uh, there's the thing that I tell everybody who's a Black artist in Nashville right now, and it's a thing that I do every day personally, and I get to do on a professional level now, is to be a Black person and take up ownership and space in country music by saying that you're actually a Black country artist. And being talented at country music at a level and degree that is at or exceeds white professionals in the same space. Uh, one of the funny things that happened to me along my two and a half year path in country music is I won the Chip Lippo Award for Excellence in Country Music Journalism. And like a, like a real jerk, uh, um, I would stand up in the middle of rooms and say that I am the best journalist in country music. Not true. But if you give me an award and you say, well, you're the best because we're giving you this document or, you know, like appreciation then it says, I am black and I'm very good at writing about country music specifically. To the same thing I say to people like Breland, I interviewed Breland for the, uh, for the Tennessean a couple of weeks ago. And I'm like, you're one of the best country music songwriters in Nashville right now. And he stops and he goes, but I'm like one of the best. I'm like, no, you're one of the best country music songwriters in Nashville. And he's like, oh, I get what you mean. And I was like, yes. Take up all the space in that. Like I, I say the same thing when I talk about like Jimmy Allen will have the number one song on the media with Brad Paisley. And I'm always like keen on saying to people, the black man has the number one song in country music. And the more that you do that, it creates a situation where if you're looking for the best artist or the best songwriter or the best journalist or the best up and coming artist that you have to look towards a black artist because we are present and apparent and at the lead of the conversation. Uh, when I was at the Black Opry House during Americana Fest last uh, September, I mean, Julie, you were there. There was one thing that I told everybody in the house and I said, you're one of the best in country music right now. That's why you are here. You know, Roberta Leah just won an award because she's really great at what she does. And you create a certain level of across the boardness, for lack of a better term, when you do that, when you have people that are willing to stand up and say, I take up space here and I'm really, really good at what I do. Uh, the one great like sadness of Charlie Pride's career in my mind is that he was so humble. Charlie Pride was the most humble man on planet Earth when it came to having a camera in his face and a microphone, in, you know, a camera in his face and a microphone in somebody's hand. Oh, I'm just Charlie Pride. You know, I, I just sing the song when you put the song in front of me on, on, on a piece of paper. And it's like, no, dude, you have 29 number one singles. Stand on a Ferrari. Be excited. Like, take up that space and don't shy from it. And I think that's a thing that essentially will change a lot of this conversation, especially for me on the countryside, when you're able to have people stand up and say, yeah, I'm great. And so when somebody in a, in a boardroom, in a, you know, a white guy with a square jaw and a square, and a square jacket, is looking for a great songwriter, they say, yeah, well, who's the best? Oh, Breland's the best. And then he shows up and you're not surprised that he's black because he's the best and everybody says it. So that's just something to think about. And it's it's kind of a ostentatious thing, but these are ostentatious times. So in my mind, it makes sense. 
Um, could could we hear from Lorenzo about you know Charles you you mentioned students and educational institutions um, being a, a training ground for musicians and when I visited uh, Jefferson Street Sound just a couple of days ago Lorenzo was telling me about the great history of students from Tennessee State University right across I mean right in the right in that um neighborhood um that you know that, that that was a training ground and um a stepping stone for a number of musicians that wound up you know being at the heart of the action and beginning their careers on jefferson street well what i was uh expressing then was uh, tennessee state uh had some of the best musicians because that was a training camp for students, for musicians and artists. Tennessee State trained some of the best artists and musicians uh, to come out of uh, uh, the city. And uh, people like uh, Etta James, uh, uh, Hank Crawford. Now, Hank Crawford, I was telling you earlier, uh, lived upstairs in this building and who was the saxophonist for Ray Charles. But then that was Charles Sherrill that uh, played bass guitar for uh, James Brown for a while. Uh, there was uh, um, Jesse Boyce, uh, um, uh, Jimmy Odie, that uh, Jimmy Odie played uh, drums for Little Richard. Jesse Boyce played uh, bass guitar for Little Richard. So a lot of these artists and uh, mus artists and musicians that were uh, rather progressive uh, at that time came through Nashville to pick up uh, musicians to hire musicians because they were the best. They could read music. Uh, they were trained by some of the best uh, professors uh, of music uh, in the country. So Nashville was a, 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 a spot to where uh, music was born and raised here in Nashville. So I am proud to uh, be able to, uh, uh, to, live, to live some of their legacies because uh, I knew a lot of these guys uh, like Dillard Montgomery who was uh, also a teacher in the high schools. Uh, John Green, who also was a teacher that played uh, uh, saxophone. Uh, Watt Watson, some of you may know, and Watt's still with us. Now, most of these uh, artists and musicians, they've gone on, uh, but their legacy is what, uh, uh, is what I, uh, try to uh, commemorate uh, and celebrate the ones that still living, but commemorate and celebrate the ones that's moved on, like Marion James and Jackie Shane, uh, all of these great artists and musicians that made waves uh, here in this city. And uh, uh, we missed the mark here in Nashville uh, and Memphis, uh, got uh, got most of the uh, accolades from the music from black music uh, back uh, in those uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and uh, we had a bunch of uh, producers, record labels uh, coming to Nashville, but right at the end, uh, country music. Uh, uh, was accelerated and they missed Nashville and some of them went to, to uh, Memphis. Uh, some of the record labels went to California. They went different places, but uh, their intent was to stop here in Nashville, but they didn't find it feasible because we had so many great artists and musicians. Uh, even Barry Gordy came through here at one time and uh, he did pick up the on the first band that was uh, chosen and signed uh, by a major label, and uh, that was a Bottoming Company, 
who was signed by Barry Gordy at the time. And matter of fact, Jesse Boyce uh, ended up writing for five or six years for uh, Motown. And he wrote the song Firefly that uh, the Temptations recorded and they got a platinum record for it. So uh, it was a lot going on here. Uh, I'm uh, embarrassed that I wasn't uh, a part of that music scene as far as being an artist, cause I loved the, the uh, music that these guys were producing. And uh, so, uh, but Nashville, you know, was a, a place to be back in those days in Tennessee State was a mecca had a, was a mecca for for great musicians and music i i would love to hear boo mitchell what you what you have to say about um generation spanning music making i mean you are someone who um who learned production and engineering by watching and working with your dad and that was happening, you know, as music was changing, as R&B and soul were changing, as hip hop was becoming really important and popular music. And that was something that you were interested in, too. And now and, you know, the the generational exchange continues at Royal Studios in in your family line. And the studio has been active that entire time. So, I mean, what does that look like? and What has it taken to to, to, to keep it keep it open, keep the studio open and active, never close your doors and to kind of bring in the next generation and just continue to evolve. You know, I think an important thing uh, with teaching the youth uh, is its exposure. Um, I, you know, know what I know because of exposure. Uh, to the music and exposure to the musicians, um, and it—I mean, it's a—it's it's a practice that you know. M my pop, Willie Mitchell. Everybody called him Pop because uh, he was like a father figure. Um, he kept getting his uh, his rhythm sections kind of taken. His his first band, Al Jackson Jr. and Louis Steinberg uh, was that was Willie Mitchell's band in '55, and when Stax opened, uh, he lost those guys to Stax. They became the Stax Rhythm Section. His second band, Reggie Young and Tommy Cogbill, all these guys, uh, he ended up losing them to American and eventually Nashville. Uh, so what he did was he found, you know, he had Leroy Hodges from High Rhythm. Leroy had a 14-year-old brother named Teeny that was trying to play the guitar, so Pop would literally pick Teeny up and, you know, bring him to the house. Teeny was was raised with my mom and aunt uh, like a brother, and Pop would come home from work and wake him up and show him chords. Uh, eventually, Charles uh, Hodges, the organist, and those guys became high rhythm because of Pop mentoring them uh, and, and teaching them. Uh, and, you know, I try to do the same thing with my younger musicians. Any session that I record with young musicians, I always uh, bring in a legacy person. Uh, and it, it's, you know, being exposed to it, 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 being in the room, it just changes your whole perspective. Um, I, I was telling a, a story on another Zoom thing I was on. Um, we did the horns for the new Silk Sonic album with, you know, Bruno Mars and Anderson Pack. And uh, the first session I did for them, you know, they were, Bruno was real specific. He wanted three horns and, you know, wanted a, a gr gritty Memphis sound. So first song, I did that. Uh, they sent another song in and uh, I knew in my heart that it needed four horns, right? Uh, but 
under strict instruction instruction I used three you know and uh, sent it back and Bruno called and said well man I want to change a little of this and the whole time that I'm on the phone with him and the producer I'm just thinking to myself this song needs four horns so uh, the original horn players uh, Cameron Whalem Bruno's trombonist uh, he's you know a young guy late 20s uh, Mark Franklin's another uh, younger guy uh, on trumpet in his 30s uh, and Kirk Smothers an another you know what I would consider a young musician so when it came time to redo the song I called in Lanny Macmillan who is a legacy guy you know Lanny's in his 60s and Lanny played for my pop uh, on, on many records uh, and as soon as I put the legacy guy or the OG in the room like the sound completely changed on that record and they loved it and said man can you do some more songs um, so I, I think it's important to you know we gotta pass the torch uh, from one generation to the next and e expose these kids to the music and the musicians. Um, I do a lot, uh, I did a lot of this with my own children, you know, I would play them, you know, when they were younger, I'd play them a hip hop song that they know and loved that would contain a sample. And then I would go and play the Otis Redden sample or the Al Green sample you know, song where it came from, and their mind, their heads would explode, jaws drop, but uh, it it gives them uh, a different appreciation for the music. Uh, I believe Dr. Charles works at Rhodes, who has an amazing uh, music program. I've, I've got interns from there now. I mean, they exposed these kids. Um, the last session I did for Rhodes, they brought the kids in with Bobby Rush. And the kids got to record a song with Bobby Rush. Like, that's on another level. Um, it, it, you know, it's a session that they will always remember um, for the rest of their lives. And it gives them a different appreciation of the music. Uh, so, you know, these two cities have, like, the richest musical history. Um, you know, it's not celebrated enough, uh, the, the back and forth that happened with Memphis and Nashville. Uh, you know, just from my dad uh, doing Al Green records, he was watching, there was a country uh, variety music show Dusty Rhodes uh, that came on Memphis Saturday morning TV and it was you know it was a country show and Dusty had two daughters two teenage daughters that sang and when Pop heard them sing he said that's the sound I want from Al Green for Al Green so you know people don't know that the background on all of those records is two teenage country girls and a guy that's singing on all these iconic soul records and you know uh, Pop's take on that there's so much country, there's so much soul and blues influence in country um, that we forget about that and my dad's take was country music and R&B is cousins that's what he always say and you know that's why you have the songs cross over so well, uh, you know, like between Kenny Rogers and Lionel Richie or Dolly Parton and Whitney Houston. Like, these songs are basically the same chord progressions, the same content, the same, you know, roots music that uh, came a hundred years ago. And it's what you put on top. You, put horns on the top, it's going to be R&B. You put a steel on the top, it's going to be country. Um, and, it, you know, it's uh, it's it's a fact that's, that's not celebrated enough. Uh, so I, I 
to end. I think I went around the no. question, but it, no, that's good though. No. <laughs> so listen, when we're talking about celebration. I'm a I'm a pivot two directions. I'm gonna throw this Marcus Charles Susan, and we're gonna leave in a, in, a, in a moment. Now, Marcus wrote this article, y'all. He wrote this piece for Rolling Stone. Well, he's first of all, we we've already acknowledged free everyone joining us that Marcus has only written about 500 articles and pieces in the last five minutes. He's for written 50. Since, he's written I, I 50 mean, while we've been having this panel. Exactly. He's probably <laughs> editing something yeah, right now on the side. I, I don't know, but <laughs> he has been full force. Congratulations, really. It's been a beautiful thing to watch. Thank you. In all these different places. But I, I am, I, I have to mention this. Um, so you wrote this piece for the Rolling Stone. And if y'all didn't see it, let me tell you what happened. So this is how it went. Um, as you may or may not recall, um, there was a conversation, a big conversation about erecting a statue of Dolly Parton at the state capitol here in Nashville. And Marcus's article, in the article, he suggests, instead of Dolly, a Black musician from Memphis would be a better choice. Yeah. Now, I know you were getting at the differences in power, including political power, resources, as well as just industry infrastructure. But I want to know, in your words, since you're here, what were you thinking, Marcus, when you wrote that? And I want to know from the historian, yeah. What, was, what would history tell us? Who should that person be? I'll pull this out. This, this is an easy one. Um, okay. In the era between 1971 and 1973, there were more wealthy, independent Black people walking around Memphis than anywhere else in America. That's a real fact. Wealthy, like not like run-of-the-mill garden variety rich. And they also were all powerful. So the Bell, the Bell Brothers ran Stax Records, which had more number one urban singles than like most labels could hope to have in a lifetime in the span of like three years. Three years. Like, it's astounding. It makes what Puffy did with Bad Boy look like homework. Like, it's not, it's not even comparable. And on top of that, Al Green is working with your father over at Royal and reimagining what R&B could sound like. And again, doing so with power. So in a time where we're talking about re-energizing Black power, also Isaac Hayes is Black Moses. He was nicknamed Black Moses for a reason, because people believed his skill in making R&B records to be so astounding that it, you know, like inspired people to do supernatural things in their lives. So I'm like at a time where we're trying to like create empowerment for black people and all people. And in that order, black people and all people. Then why not put in my head at the time, Isaac Hayes in the middle of this, in the middle of this building. So that when you walk in, black Moses is facing you. Like you have this bald headed black man in regal garb, Looking like black power. And when you look at the plaque that accompanies it and they list all of his achievements, it adds up. Like if you look at especially the era between 71 and 73, like when you watch Watt Stacks, everybody should do if you want to understand the history of Memphis music. Uh, Watts, um, Watts, so Stacks Records went to uh, Watts for the anniversary of the Watts riots and they held a music festival at the Los Angeles Coliseum. Like the very Los Angeles Coliseum where they had NASCAR races this weekend. You can see it. It's a whole thing. And Jesse Jackson introduces Isaac Hayes. Because Isaac Hayes is just that cool and that powerful and important to the era. And to me, I'm like, well, if you're going to replace, you know, a, 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 a racist general with anybody, Yes, Dolly Parton makes sense because Dolly Parton makes sense. Dolly Parton can answer every question on planet Earth right now. Like, who makes the best cake batter? Dolly Parton. You know, like, who makes the best ice cream? Dolly Parton. You know, like, do you need necessarily have to have Dolly Parton have a statue in the middle of the of, of a a a, uh, a local building? No. In my mind, I'm like, Isaac Hayes 
has this incredible history and this incredible like legacy of power, of black empowerment and black strength and black wealth and all the things, any measure that you could look at for greatness in American history. And he's, he's up there. And especially in this era where black power was celebrated. So in my mind, I'm like, we should probably make iconography of that in the same way that we make iconography of Dolly Parton's entire career. So that's the long and short. And I just add on to that. And I, I remember I, I spoke to Marcus for that piece, which you really all <coughs> agreed. And I was so glad that he was thinking about it because it had been bothering me a lot too. And for a lot of the reasons that he lays out in the piece so beautifully. And, you know, and yeah, it was in response when the Nathan Bedford Forrest statue was finally taken down. Um, finally, after all of this pressure from black activists in particular, including quite a few here in Memphis, Tennessee, right? Um, finally, you know, this horrific racial terrorist gets a little bit of redress. And the idea of replacing him with Dolly Parton, as Marcus so eloquently talks about in the piece, just felt to me like a classic, frankly, a classic white people move of we're going to we're going to take the bad white person away and we're going to put in the better white person. That's not racial justice. That's not racial justice. And as much as I love Dolly Parton, we can't turn Dolly Parton into everybody's favorite white person because that's what's happening, right? Um, Tressie McMillan Cottom also wrote a great piece about that too, about Dolly Parton as like this saint superhero figure. But anyway, enough about that. Like I, I would add on to, so I completely agreed with that. I had a slightly different take for Marcus on who it should have been though. Um, like, and I mean, hey, Isaac Hayes would be incredible. There are many people who would be, Willie Mitchell would be incredible, frankly, and very well deserved. Um, but my, what I thought should happen is actually, is actually two people. Um, we, Rufus Thomas, who obviously very much deserves it for, and yeah, Marcus and I talked about Mr. Thomas and, you know, for basically starting Sun Records with his, with the first hit they had, starting Stax Records with the first hit they had, um, WDIA, Beale Street Blues, um, you know, all of the talent that he discovered and nurtured through being, uh, the host of Amateur Night, the fact that he became an ambassador after his recording career was over for Memphis Music, um, and I also thought, though, that it would be really cool along with him to have his wife, Lorene Thomas, who, beyond being a crucial member of this family and their children, you know, Carla Thomas, TSU grad, I believe, and, uh, uh, and, and Marvell and um, Venice. Lorene Thomas was also at the very period that her husband was working and helping start Stacks and, and also working at an auto plant factory and, um, you know, trying to recover from the fact that Sam Phillips tossed him away, like he tossed all the black artists away. Um, she was also the membership secretary for the NAACP in Memphis at the moment when they were exploding in membership. Maxine Smith, our legendary activist here, talked about how crucial Ms. Thomas was. And I, I love that both because I do think it's important that we remember, I, th I you know, I mean, quite frankly, I think, I, Black women are so often at the center of the story and then get erased from it that I think it's important to remember. Uh, but also, I love the idea of them as a team, as a cohort, create, recreating Memphis and recreating the world uh, at that time too. Um, but Isaac Hayes, absolutely. And it, like, I just, there were so many better, it, DeFord Bailey would have been, you know, that like, I just think the idea to replace a terrible white Tennessean with a really great white Tennessean isn't do anything than making white Tennesseans feel better about white Tennessee. And I didn't think that was really what we should be trying to do there. And I think that's also something that we all need to keep in mind when we're thinking about all of this stuff. But that's that's my vote, the Thomas, okay. Thomas family. Well, I like the Thomas family. I, I'm gonna tell you why I, I talk about them quite often when I'm when I'm speaking out about how common it was growing up to see them at community functions, to see them driving around South Memphis. You know, it, it, it's not, it wasn't unusual in the circles that my family um, were a part of. So in the spirit of what you're saying about erasing Black women from the conversation, I've just added myself into the conversation. You see what I did there? See how I did that? For those that don't know, I have lived in Nashville now almost 30 years. 
born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. As a matter of fact, to be very specific, caught the bus twice a day, right in front of Stax Records to go to school, college in Macklemore. My, everything about, and honestly, everything that I can, can say about my musical influence, my upbringing, my ability to even learn music was a music piano teacher right there in that same zip code, that same neighborhood, my church, my home church, Metropolitan, right there, that same, right behind Lamorne in college where my family, five generations, I mean, everything about standing right there catching the bus was, was is way more important thinking about it now than I ever knew when I was doing it then. So um, shout out to South Memphis, Tennessee. Okay, well, I think we're at the end. And, you know, before I say these thank yous and goodbyes, we got to do a round rock. Just one last question to leave everyone who's watching um, with something here. And if Julie has something after this, we can certainly follow it up. But one of the things that we have made very clear that there are a lot of similarities as well as some real clear distinctions between the sound, the, the legacy, the artist, the history, as rich as it is between Memphis and Nashville. What is it that each of you would think if you all wanna go as one thing that you want us to be left with to consider that's important about the music between both? Um, so much of America's, uh, the music that was created in America that impacted the world uh, came from these two cities. Like Tennessee is definitely the state of music, uh, you know, and it's two great legacies that it's not celebrated enough. Well, I want to say uh, that Cowboy Troy and Curtis Blow have recorded in this studio that I'm trying to remodel and rebuild upstairs. So we have had some dynamic talent to come in and, and grace uh, our building. And I also want to uh, invite everybody out to the Jefferson Street Sound Museum at 2004 Jefferson Street. Nashville, Tennessee, uh, and uh, uh, our website is jeffersonstreetsound.com, and please donate. I'll quickly jump in because then I don't have to follow Marcus because I'm not trying to follow Marcus. <laughs> I'm, learning, I'm, not, I'm not that smart, but I am not that, that stupid either. Um, I would say that the one thing I would add to this too, and then I think it's been implicit in everything we've said, and I, you know, I know that everybody in our own way is is working to do that. And so many of you names who I recognize, and I'm sure names I don't on the participants are doing this too. But um, there's so many great young musicians who are in Memphis and in Nashville, and between the two, who are recreating recreating these stories with what they're doing as marcus was saying before as boo was talking about before i mean this is and as mr washington this is well you know like the the young musicians who are working in both of these places i think are often wrestling with the legacies of these places and trying to make them work as well they, as they can for them and they're just doing incredible incredible stuff and as everybody as everyone has said you know, if you're not paying attention to them now, you're just going to hear what they created in 15 years coming out of somewhere else. So support young musicians, whether they're recording musicians, working uh, live musicians, any and all things, because there are so many great musicians in both of our cities and who travel between them. And, and we're so lucky. We're so lucky. Well, I'll say... Memphis and Nashville have served as the root and the fruit for each other for probably a century. Uh, as we noted, the entire, I, and I say this all the time, the Nashville sound is just Memphis's sound with the twang. Keep it real. And so much of what Nashville is doing right now is benefiting Memphis. Like I went to the Mempho Fest, which featured a lot of like the pop and you know, relevant sounds to the modern conversation being heard in Memphis. And back and forth, these two cities 
can stay in musical conversation. So my greatest hope of this conversation, actually, and the reason why, besides being able to hang out with Gina and Julian, Lorenzo, all you guys, and Boo and Charles, who are all my friends, uh, is to be able to engender everybody who is watching this conversation to push for greater musical communication between Nashville and Memphis. Like, Boo Mitchell is a resource. And it's in Memphis, Tennessee, which is two hours down I-40. You can get in a car and go there in enough to, in, in as much time as it takes to go anywhere else you're going on tour. So if you have a free weekend, go to Memphis. And for people who are in Memphis, there is a core of Black artists specifically in Nashville, Tennessee, who need broader community than just the people they see walking around in East Nashville or wherever they live and feeling frustrated about the fact that they are in a situation here in Nashville that oftentimes appears racially and socially onerous. So being able to have community from a place that is historically pr proven to be fertile community for Nashville artists is essential. So those are just things to think about. Yes. Whew. We could go on and on and on, but I think we just should stop right here and leave you all wanting some more. Maybe we will do this again. Thank you for all of your enthusiasm and energy in this chat, too. It has been <laughs> incredible. I, I love, and I know all of you love seeing all the comments and, and the, the good vibes that you've been sending our way. So we appreciate your participation there as well. And I'm going to toss it back to Shannon. Our first, wait, well, let me do this. Julie. Y'all, Julie is my real friend in real life. And I just have to say thank you. All y'all are, but I've got to definitely say thank you to my co-moderator who continues to challenge me in ways that she has no idea that she does. I am a fan, girl fan of her, of her work. And for sure, um, she has contributed greatly tonight here with us and in this landscape of music as well. As another woman, I, I can tell you she's one of few who is out here doing the, the work to make sure that are being recognized and their stories are being fairly and equitably told. So thank you, Julie, for your participation and for your support of what's happened here on our scene and beyond. Thank you for thank you for letting me be a part of it. It's <laughs> it's been it's been an honor. It's been just wonderful to hear from everyone. Danny? Thank you, Gina. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you to our incredible panelists, our phenomenal moderators. It's been a great night. Please note, our event tonight as well as previous events are live on our YouTube channel and you can find Nashville Music Equality on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. So spread the word and follow us for more impactful conversations this year. Lastly, please check out our website, NashvilleMusicEquality.com to see our brand new merch. We've uh, we got some merch, so yeah. Go check us out. For every item that's sold, the funds will go to help us curate these important conversations and additional content and uh, create educational opportunities. So from all of us at Nashville Music Equality, once again, thank you for coming out. Good night.